Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and now powered by our first sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White. I am here in the belly of the beast for episode number 41. 42, 41, 42, somewhere in there. We're getting up there. We're moving fast. Uh, today, we have another incredible family and friends guest episode. Our guest is none other than the great Tim Gordon for part two, as promised. Today, we talked about feminism, marriage, and the prospect of childbearing in modern society. Uh, Tim Gordon and I's conversation last week was um, very, very powerful, very deep, very uh, historically accurate, and and uh, had rave, rave reviews and feedback from the audience. Uh, and and uh, I'm very happy, happy that we were able to get him back on for part two, as promised. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the great Tim Gordon. Welcome back to Please Call Me Crazy, Tim Gordon. We're happy to have you again. We This is As Promised, uh, part two from our family and friends guest episode last Friday. And we had some stuff we needed to get into. The, there was overwhelming um, rave reviews and feedback from our first interview. A lot of people have been following it the entire time, especially our uh, faithful audience there on Getter. Uh, that is streamed on the War Rooms Getter page every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or any day that I have an episode. Uh, we got rave reviews that this was probably the best episode thus far, uh, and that's saying something. We've had some some great hitters on on the on the show thus far, uh, including Steve Bannon, Alex Jones, the great AJ Barker, Professor Penn. The list goes on. Chris Martinson. So um, I think our our production is getting pretty succinct too. So that might have added to it. But Tim Gordon definitely laid out the track for many, many spiritual uh, fundamentals, many Christian fundamentals, many Catholic fundamentals. Uh, and I, I, I absolutely enjoyed having the conversation and I really enjoyed watching it back. Uh, and I enjoyed seeing a lot of people, uh, um, what do you wanna say, freak out at some of what, what they would call <laughs> radical, radical insights that Tim Gordon, and factual, factual insights that, that Tim Gordon was laying down about the history of uh, the the biggest uh, religion or faith or spiritual uh, community in the entire world. But today we're going to get into more of, I think you could say the ne- the niche of Tim Gordon's um, Tim Gordon's political, cultural and and religious commentary. Uh, Tim Gordon is 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 the uh, the anti-feminist in the Catholic community. And uh, that, that's what we didn't really get a chance to dive into last week. And we wanted to create a, or have an, 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 an entirely, an entire episode dedicated to this one topic, one, because of how pervasive it is across the world in the church, but two, because Tim Gordon dropped so many bombs, we, we know we're going to need time to let, let this, this, uh, to let this fester and, and, and spill over in today's episode. So. Um, Tim, thanks for being back. Uh, we appreciate your time again. Um, Thank you. And, and kick us off where you where you want to start. I mean, I, I'll, I'll lay this out first. I think it's slowly but surely becoming very obvious that there's something something very wrong with how um, the feminist movement or women's rights. Um, Feminism in general, especially radical feminism, especially postmodern feminism, femini- feminism today, uh, has has be- is out of control. I mean, I think pe- people are slowly waking up to it. I'm seeing it at least online. Maybe I'm just in my own little my own little algorithmic echo chamber there on on. But but it's social media platforms that don't particularly favor the men uh, or what they would call the oppressive patriarchy. Uh, and, uh, certainly hostile towards men. And, and yet and still, I continue to see many, many videos, a lot of content of, of people, but even women who are rejecting the tenets of, of radical feminism. I don't, however, think that they understand the history and the origins of it, much like they don't understand uh, from a spiritual standpoint, from a religious standpoint, uh, much like I don't think people understand 
uh, the tenets of much of today's culture and where it came from on, on any side of any issue, whether it be technology, politics, so on and so forth. So I don't think people have really connected the dots of, of where this whole feminism crisis started, where it originates from, uh, from a historical standpoint or a spiritual sense. Uh, and I hope that you can give us some insight into, into your, your views on that uh, in terms of the church and the broader political landscape. Well, three things right out of the box. Number one, feminism, and I do mean first wave feminism, is the original gender, trans, uh, gender dysphoria. There's, there's no doubt about that. If you say that ergonomically a, a woman can act like a man or a man can act like a woman, then you're going to get uh, Skittles, homosexualism, and, and uh, proper gender dysphoria down, down the line. Um, Skittles is just a woman and a man can swap roles in the bedroom, if you think about it. And then actual gender dysphoria, as uh, diagnosed by DSM-5, which is trans or whatever, is just the idea that uh, some confused person that we need to pray for believes that they actually are a man if they're a woman or a woman if they're a man. And it's it's not complex. In 1848, hopefully we'll get into 1848 today, first wave feminism is the original gender dysphoria. Point number two, this is leaking into the popular right-wing media. It's not just your imagination, Royce. This book started it all. It was blurbed by my friend Michael J. Knowles at the Daily Wire. Uh, he said, said mansplitting at its best. He's, he's actually written the forward for two of my books. He didn't write the forward for this one. We decided to have no forward, but he, he read it. And uh, presumably, I'm presuming he gave it to Matt Walsh, also at the Daily Wire. They recently went on to uh, Matt Frad show, a Catholic podcaster, and they um, they said, look, this is the only right way of looking at what is a woman. I did a video uh, about a year ago called what Matt Walsh's what is a woman should really have been about. And it shouldn't have. Nec- I mean, it's a good it's a good documentary. But if you want to go to a problem, Royce, you go to the root of the problem. Yeah. Transgender. That's you've never met anyone that's actually transgender, or maybe you're lucky if you have. Most people haven't. That's something that's cooked up by the elites, let's say that, from the top. And it's based on feminist original gangster uh, gender dysphoria. That's what it is. So Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles are now mentioning this in, in talks. You know, they're the case for patriarchy. There's an original gender dysphoria. That's that's point number two. And point number three is that um, everybody else in the wake of this new direction of travel is kind of backpedaling. When I when I first went on uh, the morning podcast circuit and I announced, hey, I'm writing this book, The Case for Patriarchy, at the time we were going to call it No Christian Feminism – uh, that was before uh, there's another author on it. We severed authors. He's going to call his that. I took my chapters. He took his. It created quite a wave. That was four summers ago that I announced that. I went on Matt Frad's show, the same guy that had uh, uh, Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles. And I said, look, there is no good feminism. So that's the third point here. All feminism is evil. First wave feminism hails to 1848. It's something called the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York. People like Elizabeth Cady Stanton there who memorialized the minutes. And the goals were those of radical feminism or, or what, what's called second wave feminism in 1970 or third wave feminism in 1992. Now we have fourth and fifth wave feminism. Fifth wave feminism, as I've termed it, is just the fallacious notion that one can be a Christian and a feminist. So you get people that are pro-life but also pro-feminist like Lila Rose, this doesn't work. First wave feminism (laughs) contains all the seedlings for all of the later feminism. So don't say radical feminism, I tell people. It's all there in in the Senate. It was radical radical from the beginning. Absolutely. Not not in some abstract way. You can go read uh, the Declaration of Sentiments, which is a hilarious title for the memorialized minutes of a bunch of gals getting together and um, modeling what they're doing after the Declaration of Independence. And they say, we need women in the clergy, radical. We need women away from their babies, 
radical. We need to get women out of their homes, radical. We need women to be paid as much as men once they get out of their home. We need, um, they, they mentioned some voting stuff, which is all the cucked center right ever talks about as associable with first wave feminism because it sounds a little bit less bad. A like less like women weren't, weren't given the right to vote and that was probably wrong. Um, yeah, yeah, women definitely weren't given the right to vote. I, I've never taken a stance on this issue. I, so so I, I've I, been I don't on address Because I, I say that because I've been on the record. You know, first mm -hmm. of all, I am probably the, the tip of the spear when it comes to, to, to an, uh, a, a sort of overt animus towards liberal white women, but, but not just liberal white women. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all of the offshoots of liberal white women. And, and we know historically before the civil rights movement and this, this sort of proto women's rights movement that typically the black woman was not sort of uh, co-opted into this women's rights feminism deal. They were mostly uh, uh, black women that were in the homes with their families and took care of their kids and do a communal effort, a more genuine communal effort by necessity, if, if nothing else. Um, but, but that's just kind of the way that things shook out historically. And then uh, one day, you know, the, the, the white liberal woman, the neoliberal woman, the neoconservative women, uh, they went over to the black community and say, hey, said, uh, hey, uh, the black man g got the right to vote before you did. And, and here came the, you know, the welfare state and the split of the black family. Uh, Jason and I and many black commentators talk about this history, this, this forgotten and, and uh, besmirched history of, uh, of feminism and black feminism. But I've been on the record saying, yeah, I think the right to vote probably was in was is is at least in the realm of something reasonable uh, that that we should have been, you know, th that was an error, right? I mean, there were there there are blatant errors in history where you go back and went, well, if I had to choose, getting all the way here or having the you know letting this issue be the wedge issue that was the springboard for all of the radical iterations of this thing, uh, maybe the I mean, not maybe I think. Giving women the right to vote is necessary. It was. It should have always. You know that was that was kind of ridiculous. But let me. What, what do you think? I mean, you were saying you haven't really taken a position on this. What do you think? Well, because it's such a stalking horse for real first wave feminism. I, you don't I, like. I it. actually don't even. I don't even weigh in it on uh, in the book. But no, I, I'm probably not in favor of it. I, I would say, it's it's not as important as folks assume. The vote's sort of a joke anyway. Whoa, whoa, but, whoa, whoa, uh, whoa, go. <laughs> don't, 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 don't graze past that one. What do you, where, yeah, go ahead, go. Let's get into it, yeah. yeah go yeah. ahead with that one. I mean, so, look, when, now, when the more we understand the way that the UN, the WEF, the, the pyramidal hierarchies in the world work, yeah. the less the vote matters. Uh, after the fundamental change of the U.S. Constitution worked, Post post Civil War, by guys like, well Lincoln himself, but we got Wilson, uh, first Roosevelt, and then the big ones, the second Roosevelt, the 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 local rights subsidiarity in the United States that was hardwired into the Constitution, yeah. things like the police, Tenth Amendment, police power, voting matters much much less than it once did in the first place. I'm not saying it matters none. But the more I get red pilled on what's gone on with the WEF and the way they run everything in the world the last three to five years, yeah. the less I think it matters for anyone. But I, I do think um, that w the hard positions of the book that are we can we can analogize to voting, though, again, I, people have to believe me, it's really a stalking horse issue The the, the first wave feminism was a stalking horse for getting women away from their babies. And so into you're the saying when you say stalking horse, you're saying that the the right to vote for women was was a was a was a springboard for all these other more corrupt and and uh, manipulative uh, agendas from the feminist movement. Not even so much a, a springboard, like oh, from the right, a springboard uh, would would um, circumscribe that. Some more reasonable stuff, like, oh, with the right to vote, they did all this other stuff, and it got kind of out of hand, mm. kind of radical. That's more the typical story mm. of first-wave feminism. Mm. Conversely, what I'm pitching is the right to vote was one of the smallest things, the the narrowest uh, you know, substantive areas covered at 
the Seneca Falls Convention, which was where it all began. And this was not their concern. They were talking about getting women into the workplace, getting women away from their husbands and babies. You, there, no progress can be made if women are with babies the way they have been for all of human history, the way they're designed. I even go through the, the biology in this book. Um, they're designed to do that. And then, you know, they toss in some of the, the, the franchise bit. But I, I, the reason I literally, without even attempting to be mute, I, I'm not really mute on any issues that, I, that tend to come in, in my way, particularly in my four books, is because it's so comparatively unimportant mm. to what, what the real goal of first, second, third, fourth wave feminism all was. And it is fundamentally to change human rapport, to change the way that human beings relate to one another in the original cell, the single cell of society, the family, to have two incomes per family. And this is, this is what I really strongly stand against and, and what all the Catholics four years ago reacted against. And now they're silently backpedaling and they're saying, oh, Tim was right. All of the 20th century popes, nine places in scripture, uh, to, uh, the entire Catholic magisterium between the writing of scripture and the the eight twentieth century popes who mentioned it, all are very, very clear that women are ontologically private creatures. Men are ontologically public creatures. Women are receptive, as the theology of the body suggests. Uh, men are expressive. Women are fundamentally uh, passive. Men are fundamentally active. It's even called the active-passive principle in intercourse. Yeah. So. Yeah. The goal is to get women out of homes, to get them away from babies. The socialists and communists like John Dewey out of the University of Chicago said we, we're not getting um, women away from their babies during World War I, World War II early enough. So they made up kindergarten, a communist invention. Um, that, then that wasn't enough. So they went to preschool. This was all centered around the beating heart of the left. If you think the beating heart of the left, um, oh, oh, gentle viewer is trans or even the Skittles stuff or even economic Marxism, you're wrong. The beating heart of the left is the original gender dysphoria. And guess what? Feminism is even the original sin. It's the original sin between Adam and Eve. It's, it's a man acting, a husband acting like a woman standing down, being passive instead of active, receptive instead of expressive, and the woman standing up being expressive instead of receptive and, and, and passive instead of active. It's there in the, gen, in the original sin. So, I, yeah, this is why I don't get into to voting. It's the yeah. least controversial topic I could have treated in this book. Everything is women need to be at home. We need single uh, income households. We need absolute Christian clarity. I don't care whether you're pro – we talked about Protestants last time. I'm talking – the Protestants are really good on this. Better than Catholics. Now, here's my ecumenical Oprah moment, right? I'm giving them credit. Particularly Calvinists are way better because you know what? They, After all the stuff I talked last week, they take Scripture seriously. And whether we're talking Ephesians 5, which everyone knows, or 1 Timothy, Titus, uh, where are all the other ones? 1 Corinthians. Yeah. Uh, there are so many passages. I have a little cup with all of them. Maybe, maybe that's it. Um, all the passages in scripture were just like women have to, wives have to submit to their husbands in all things. Popes later added, except for grave mortal sin. You can't make your wife kill someone or stop going to mass on Sunday. But all things not directly eating, women are submissive, like Ephesians 5, chapter 22, 23 say. All things. That's the beating heart of this, Royce. And I just to add on to what you're saying, and I, and, and I want you to go a little bit deeper, but... Um, what what I what I understand in in what you're saying is like the Rockefellers, right? The Rockefeller Foundation was very integral in the promulgation of the women's rights movement as a philanthropic and humanitarian effort. And this is where many Christians, Catholics, conservatives, right wingers, uh, you know, Republicans, and the list goes on and on and on. Truthers, libertarians, pick a pick a group. This is where many many error is we seem to get hung up 
in the financial and economic implications of a movement like feminism, whether they be subversive or, or not. We just, we, our mind and our, our, our lexicon and our worldview around political wedge issues tends to ruminate on the economic and financial implications. And I'm as much of a finance hawk as, as anybody. I mean, my whole, you know, my, my whole uh, call to fame is, is to have been one of the few people to ever march on the Federal Reserve, right? Especially in a number of, uh, of thousands or 10,000. So I'm, I'm, no, uh, I'm no pacifist when it comes to economic and uh, financial monetary policy. However, I will say that uh, the Rockefellers, and so w- relevant to this, many people point out that the Rockefellers used the women's rights movement as a way to corruptly allow the Federal Reserve and all of the financial institutions a uh, 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 sort of Trojan horse to be able to tax the American people twice, right? You get to tax the men, and now you get to tax the women as well. And then you even get to justify an expansive government and budget because you need the public schools to become a daycare system for both parties. It's clearly true, and it, it's corrupt. But these groups like the Rockefellers, and this is what this show has been trying to dig, dig down and, and mine out, these people, like the Rockefellers, like the WEF, and many other groups uh, throughout history, were playing at something much deeper than the convenience of financial monetary corruption. That's just a bonus. All of this yeah. stuff plays much deeper than that. Speak to speak to that, and I think you already, you know, were headed that way. But I wanted to add that political and global monetary financial context. It's like, you know, we want to point out the monetary policy and how it's corrupt, but understand that it's just a bonus. The real battle is much, 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 much more pervasive. I couldn't possibly a- agree anymore with what you just said. I mean, and the Fed, right? And the fucking Fed. Great. But you know what's a, a million times more important than ending the Fed, which I, I, I've been saying this for at least 15 years. You know what's a million times more important than one out of, I don't know what, a thousand kids thinking that they're trans and not just doing it with a sense of irony with their tongue in their cheek. Cause it's, it's kind of funny at this point to, um, to play up on a trope. You know, what's a million times more important than one out of a hundred kids thinking he's, he's, uh, attracted to his own sex is the 99.5. I'll be generous. I think it's 99.9% of households. Royce that were raised that were raised and about half of them end in divorce yours and my friends growing up raised under a war of the sexes and by a war of the sexes I mean something that like a lot of this stuff was created top down by groups like the ones you're talking about the Bilderbergs and the central planners the evil elitists but it's also there in the original sin Human concupiscence, that means the state of our, the the fallen state of our intellects and wills after the fall of Adam and Eve. Mm. This accrued specifically due to a man standing down, the first man, and his wife standing up and taking his place. This means that we have a perfect storm of the main non servium, that's what Satan said. Non servium, I will not serve satanic moment in human life, even boiling down to original sin played upon by the elites, particularly in the last 170 years, since 1848. You have the absolute most pervasive problem at the heart of political communities. And that means the wider political configuration, you know, politics, and that means the household. It influenced every single household I knew growing up in grammar school, middle school, high school. Yeah, like a little bit less than half of the households wound up with a divorced mom and dad. And that's really messed up. Right. What about all the, say, 60%? Those numbers are jiggered a little bit. But let's say the 60% of households that didn't end in divorce, they weren't much better. Now, of course, I'm a Catholic. We have no divorce. So they're, they're ontologically better categorically because they didn't have a divorce. But here's why they weren't much better. When your mother every day is making decisions for the household that a man that your father ought to be making, when your mother is the one that you go and ask, I mean, this is how it was in, in it. I didn't, I lived in the household least afflicted by this. My dad's a big 
six foot three dude. My mom respected him a lot. There's still some downstream stuff of that because because of baby boomers were so universally afflicted. But but my household was less afflicted by this than anyone I knew. When the mother is the one that you go to that keeps tabs on you, when the mother is acting as the priest, prophet, king of the household, which is what the father is supposed to be, getting you re- hey, get ready for church. Hey, we're going to do a family rosary, which now this is where my household was more typical. This was my mom that cared about getting ready for church. If we were traveling on vacation, it was my mom that was finding a church to, to go to in the local area. It was my mom that ever said, hey, let's pray, let's fast, let's do whatever, mm. have a rosary. And that gets viewed, the most masculine thing, the call to the vocation to Christianity gets marked as effeminate, as it is in so many of my Hispanic friends' households. They're all Catholic, but it was their mom saying, you know, get 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 your stuff on, we're going to church. Um, the dad stayed home and watched boxing or football uh, and drank beer. Now, my dad went to church with us, but it was the real gusto in terms of what, what galvanized us to get ready and go was my mom and all my friends' moms. And I think even my dad, who's a very masculine dude, one time told me, well, I don't pray rosaries because it seems like a woman thing. I was like, no, 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 dad. This is, look at the history of the rosary. Like the 11th century, like St. Dominic, this is a weapon. Um, so that's just one component of it though. I don't, I, I, I don't have mostly religious truths. People are expecting that from the last show we did. It's mainly practical, logistical truisms of um, being raised by moms that are acting like dads and dads that are acting like moms. It's gotten a little bit more flagrant now, and and you see it everywhere. I, I haven't seen an NBA commercial that doesn't have the WNBA logo logo on it this this particular year in the playoffs. All of the commercials have, like, the superstar, Steph Curry or uh, or Kevin Durant, and then some, I guess it's a WNBA player. The parody is being pushed hard, and it's there, if you want to know, it's in Agenda 2030 to push women's sports harder than they have been. The WNBA has been out 29 years. It's been, uh, it hasn't, hasn't made the books any one of those years. It is parasitic upon the NBA, and yet they keep pushing it, and the WEF and groups like that are whoever the ultimate authors of Agenda 2030 are beneath the UN, they're like, push women's sports harder. And even though the WNBA is failing, they're getting pushed harder and harder and harder. It's because it's subversive. Like one in three or one in two in five girls who play sports start having problems with their period. All you have to do is consult the biology. When a man gets really strong and virile, what does it do to his endocrinology? It makes him extra, extra healthy. Higher testosterone, lower cancer rates, better obviously for your vascular health better life expectancy. When a woman goes to the Olympics or even plays sports at the varsity level, lots of studies done on this, they won't tell you. Like two in five women that play, or young women that play sports at the varsity level start skipping or missing their periods. They start having reproductive problems. What is the quiddity, the formal definition of a man? Well, it's it's a father in potency. What's the quiddity of a woman? It's a mother in potency. And something like sports is a great biological tell because a man, when he gets better for sports, not only does it make him better at protecting the household, but also it makes him more actually reproductively virile. A woman, not so. That's the proof text. Do you think there's lots of ways we can go with this? Yeah. Well, one is, do you think that there's a way? Do you see that there's a way? This is going to be. I already know that because I know Tim personally. (laughs) This is going to be a funny. Funny answer, but um, in all, in all seriousness, do you think there's a way, uh, a level of intellectual gravitas and, and perspective that we could develop in the modern world to be able to both appreciate women's sports and not let it be used as a hydra in this greater subversive plan to undermine masculinity writ large? Is there, because you know, I, I came up like, for example, I came up, number one, some of my uh, female cousins played volleyball, okay? I think volleyball is a fantastic game. It's just, it's exciting to watch. Volleyball, in some in some instances, women's volleyball is more exciting than women's basketball, uh, in, in my opinion, because the action is just so nonstop. Um, 
And maybe when I was 18, I was uh, 17, 16, 15. In my pu- pubescent years, I was a, a, a bit of a perv and liked to watch the the high school girls playing their their volleyball spanks. I don't know, you know, it was male male physiology may have been weighing on me in that in that instance too. But just from a from a from a sport aspect, like the volleyball game is is very uh, fast paced and, and it's it's exciting. Um, women's basketball, on the other hand, I think is is categorically defined by the women who can best differentiate themselves from the underwhelming ceiling of talent and athleticism in the women's game. Right. So like I, I Paige Buchers, for example, who's from Minnesota, she went to Hopkins high school, incredible basketball player, in my opinion, probably one of the best women's basketball players in the history of the state of Minnesota and on her way to being one of the regarded as one of the all time great women's basketball players, uh, 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 in college and, and of all time, if she can get herself back healthy, um, but but her greatness is great is 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 greatly juxtaposed to the other women because she plays more like a man would play in terms of her movement, in terms of her intent, in terms of her style, and and you know all of these things. Um, so so I do think that's a reality. Uh, that that we should just be able to acknowledge. Um, we we fail to be able to acknowledge that, or we go out of our way to try and you know talk around that. Um, but I think the women's game could like if they lowered the hoop to nine feet, let the women dunk. You know, I think that would make the game better. We 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 won't do these things because we live under this false auspice that women, the women's game and the men's game is is equal. I mean, it's just it's absolutely ridiculous. As an athlete, it's absolutely ridiculous. Okay. LeBron James, if LeBron James played women's basketball, it wouldn't, it, it, it'd be, it'd be unreal. I mean, it'd be, it'd be like, this is a, this is ridiculous. This is a person from an entirely different planet, an entirely different uh, galaxy playing sports against little children, right? I mean, you could take the most physically fit athletic women's basketball player, take the most fit women's athlete in big stick sport history. And compare their body physically, their athleticism physically to LeBron James. That should tell you all you need to know about this whole debate of women's sports and men's sports being comparable or equal. And the women's game doesn't generate the entertainment or the or the the, the viewership. And their claim is that it doesn't generate the viewership because there's not enough money put into the the marketing. Uh, you know, that well, you know, one because they haven't gone out of their way to make the women's game entertaining. But I, I digress. Anyway, that one kind of is personal because I'm an athlete. But do you think there's a way for us to appreciate women's sports uh, and not let it be a hydra for a much more uh, subversive agenda? Uh, no, no, I don't. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm categorical on that. Not at all. I, I'm dead serious. Like, look, we have to look at the problem in its roots. Gender dysphoria... <laughs> Is a man acting like a woman, a woman acting oh, like a man? man. Like, do you? I, I'm not. Look, field hockey. Field hockey is a is was designed to be a woman's sport. I think that, and I always grew up making fun of volleyball guys. I was a I was a basketball guy. Basketball all the way. I respect you if you're a, you're a football player or a boxer, but but I mean basketball is the greatest sport in the world. Yeah. Basketball's design like Steph Curry's shorter than some of the women in the WNBA and their physiology is do you know you have to appreciate how different the physiology between men and women are basketball is a men's sport it's a contact sport but also it's a sport for running which women are not good at they're they're hip they get hip dysplasia because of their fundamentally different like bodies with regard to running, They're which not is good which runners. is why which is why ACL injuries are so overwhelmingly common in the women's sport women's basketball community. I mean, and especially at the younger age, even the younger ones are getting hurt even more than than historically. Uh, girls are tearing the ACLs just on routine routine con- conditioning drills and practice. It's, I mean, it's a it's a statistical fact. This isn't a right. this isn't a theory. Oh. All this is. What's the highest vertical in the WNBA? Don't don't tell me because because uh, Royce, I I have you. I think you're I think you're up here. If you know the fact offhand, I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> I could not what's tell the, you. No, I'll bet you it's not 30 inches. Um, women can't run. Women can't jump. Women aren't strong the way the way four fours and fives traditionally were strong. Obviously, the game the game's changed a lot because of uh, 
uh, the focus on on high pick and roll and, and stuff like that, shooting outside. But still, you got to be strong. So women aren't strong. Uh, women can't run and can't jump. Um, so there. So this is a game built for them. Now, field hockey is a game that was designed for women. Even volleyball, which I tended to 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 you know mock men's volleyball players which is uh, on the beach this is something that's taken sort of seriously in california but you're right it is a fun game you get drawn into a game and you're like i have to admit that's pretty fun it's a it's a pretty exciting game it is like i will give you that i'm not i'm not giving you shit on that but it's still based around jumping women don't have leaping ability it, it's like half yeah, but the, the volley, but the volleyball game has been built to be relative to women's jumping capabilities. You don't have to be that good of a jumper to be able to no. get clear the net, right, and spike the ball. And you just have to be reasonably tall. And if you're reasonably tall in women's volleyball, you probably have some reasonable jumping skill. Or really, you don't have to be that athletic. I mean, when you go see a woman, it's funny because these women make these big swooping motions to go up and spike the ball, but it's really all drama, right? I mean, like, you don't have to be, the the, volley, the women's volleyball game, what I'm saying, is built around the, the anatomical, uh, physiological differences between men and women, which is why it looks so weird when men play it. And they clear their entire chest over the top of the net to spike yeah. the ball. It's like, yeah, this yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. Um, I, I, what I do, I mean, I'm a philosopher. I'm a trained philosopher, right? I, I, you know, I'm working on my PhD right now in, in Thomism. So we, we look to the teleology surrounding phenomena, which is to say look at the, the study of final causes, the telos in Greek. And – whether I mean, you could go through. A, how about baseball? How about softball? How about I mean, how about football? How about this? How about that? Sports are designed to increase testosterone, and whether they're hard contact sports or indirect contact sports like basketball or non-contact sports, they increase testosterone. A lot of people don't know when they run. Um, not non sprints when they run distance running for 25 minutes or longer it starts increasing your estrogen decreasing your running so it's 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 fundamentally we know that's for females right females aren't sprinters what's good for for women is um long jogs is a way to stay in good shape cuz it it speaks to their body chemistry actually produces estrogen lowers testosterone because of the cortisol release and things like that um so we we need to look at that trust the science right Whatever increases testosterone, I'm I'm looking at the name. There's a nifty little name. I have a for problem. This problem. I have to. I'll, I'll add this to you for you though. Let's let me throw you this curveball in there. Okay, uh, from an athletic standpoint, um, what do you make of this? Boxers, MMA fighters, Muay Thai fighters. First of all, I don't think there's anybody non weapons based that's more dangerous, physically dangerous, explosive, and, and violent in their motion, in their economy of motion, than Muay Thai fighters. The art of eight limbs, a Muay Thai guy, if you if you meet a Muay Thai guy in an alley oh, and he doesn't have, and you don't, neither one of you have a weapon, you're coming out of that alley bloody. And if you make it out of that alley at all, okay? Because that's how yeah. deadly the Muay Thai guys are. And the Muay Thai guys, you know, we're having the great Greg Nelson on Friday uh, this week, this family and friends edition, who's a, you know, a, a, as, as great a Muay Thai uh, expert as you could possibly find, one of the all-time great MMA coaches, trained multiple world champions, Brock Lesnar, Sean Shirk, and the, the woman, Rose Namaunas, who is a straight-up killer and, and for in her own respect, uh, no doubt. Probably from a talent standpoint, she's uh, – she's, um, Technically, talent-wise, skill-wise, she's probably better than than uh, than Brock was from an MMA standpoint. Um, but I know that you you're killing me. But from a technical standpoint, as a martial artist, she's a she's a killer. But all of those sports, they run distance running, 90, 90 minutes, an hour. Boxers, the great Muhammad Ali, the great Floyd Mayweather. Uh, the, these guys were notorious for their you know sixty minute sixty minute runs you know, on the treadmill. This is common practice for for high-level fighters um, and high-level uh, combat sports guys, and even in the military, right? In the military, which is really a man's game, to, to say the least, the ultimate death, uh, death match in many ways 
um, they're very, they're long distance runners as well. They they do a lot of long distance endurance running as well. So what do you what do you think about what do you make of that? Are there exceptions to it or what? Well, yeah, I mean the boxer's got to put in his road work. I'm I'm not saying not now they they're doing road work in a much different way than like your your skinny uh you know typical track or not track runner but your cross, your cross country, country yeah, runner. Yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. those, you see those kids running around a high school. It's like they look they look like girls. <laughs> um, so so boxers boxers have to put in road work and they're doing things with their arms i'm not sure if that um influences well i think the, here here's what here's what i would say on it. I, I i now that you say that I, I didn't think of it but i would say that the running so what we run for in mma and, and greg nelson talks about this often is it's the leg endurance right when you run right. long distance you create these micro fractures in your in your bones, in your leg bones, and 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 you create these micro tears in your in your uh, in your muscles, in your leg muscles, calf muscles, whatever else strengthens the ankles, right? Gives you that ability to be able to move your feet constantly, right? And it, with without getting tired, it's just it's just a a psychological thing, probably just as much as anything else, but definitely a little bit cardiovascular. The real cardio and and boxing and sports like that comes a lot from um, explosive short interval training. Right. So on Muay, in Muay Thai, it's being on the pads. You got to go as hard as you can go on the tie pads for a three minute round. And then you have five three minute rounds. And by the time that you know, get the third round, guys vomit. Right. Because they're just that's that explosive short interval training. Um, but but to your point, I think that for boxers and mixed martial artists and some of the military guys, the running piece is complementary to everything else that they're doing. Right, the running piece is complementary to the for the MMA guys to the grappling to the to the weightlifting to the the pushups and the core work. It's it's just a complementary piece. It's like the final touches. So continue, but yeah, no, no. Look, and also I, I agree with you. I think I think it's speaking the obvious into the air in the room. But Muay Thai are the hands down greatest strikers. Yeah, yeah I've, I've I've yeah I've gotten in lots of debates about this in the past and when you're i mean when we're talking to people out in the suburbs who are, are, are confronting an epidemic of the lowest testosterone in the history of mankind did you people know this that we have the lowest men have the lowest testosterone on average that than they've ever had um i'm speaking to you most suburban people get home from work they got the little belly or in some cases the big belly happening if it's a typical suburban situation to bring this back around to the, the feminism thing, they're getting screeched at by by their wife, which is actually can actually affect your endocrinology, um, because most most men, I'll just come out and say it, have such disrespectful wives that that screech at them, that, that boss them around, bark orders. This actually can affect your cortisol levels uh, uh, and and lower your testosterone over the long term. Um, they, they, if they're going to work out, they're going to do one thing. I'm just suggesting. I, I'm also not like I, I, I ran. A, I've run a marathon, so it's not like I, I'm saying never distance run. I ran the Rome Marathon when I lived out there, but um, with a respectable time, I think. But I didn't know about the testosterone lowering then. And Brock Lesnar does not have to worry uh, that his road work is going to make him less of a beast, right? I mean, he's you're doing so much explosive stuff. The most explosive testosterone creation uh minute minute per minute pound for pound is any upper leg stuff yeah. that really tears that muscle squats so, deadlifts squats, hand cleans yeah. right hand cleans mm -hmm. power cleans yeah like do those and then the the relatively minor to middling uh testosterone lowering you're gonna get because you can't be fat you have to do road work you got to do cycling or road work um, will be de minimis. So, I, and I'm also not like an exercise freak, but I, I do I do make sure that all men need to do one push exercise, one pull exercise, one upper leg exercise to keep the testosterone high in the 40s. So you need at least those three, and then you need to have you need to augment what the testosterone does, which keeps belly fat uh, low by doing some cardiovascular stuff. I've moved from running to uh, cycling. But you're right. You don't you don't notice the same uh, leg workout. So when I go play basketball uh, on the weekends, uh, yeah, my wind's high, but but uh, 
you know, the, the legs get more tired than when I was running every day. At any rate, the, the real point is the whole package here. Yeah. And I'm just, all I'm saying with like, we, we can, uh, as good friends, I, I respect you a lot. I, I I'm, I'm categorically against women's sports yeah. and I'm like, yeah, against, <laughs> against women's sports, particularly pro. I mean, if you want to play field hockey, fine, but here's the thing, man, <laughs> women, women are cut out for, and I'm not saying this like macho, and I, I want to speak to a wider problem. <laughs> You've come on C-Mask with us. Oh, no, wait, 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 Tim, wait. Before you go, listen, you guys got to understand that I've been watching Tim's podcast for many, 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 many months, many a year before we ever met, first of all, and before we ever became friends and started to work together. And it's just these kind of, these kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> clear moments where he says the, the most, the most politically controversial thing you could possibly imagine of the time, but he does it with a dead seriousness that me and AJ Barker, who's my best friend, and, and Tim's in our our crew. You could say it. Uh, we don't really have a crew, but you know we're we're all boys, and uh, it's those moments where me and AJ will just break out watching a Tim episode and start crying, laughing. And Tim never breaks stride. Like it, it was never humorous to him, unless you point it out. Right now, he's kind of smirking. But if you, yeah, it's hard it, not to smirk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in real time, he never even breaks stride on these things, and that's why you know I love to you know come to love Tim Gordon and his content and the Rules for Retrograde podcast. Uh, it's it's absolutely hilarious to me. I feel di I feel a little different. Here's what I'll say in final about the women's sports. I don't want to divert you, and I want to let you talk to the whole package because that's what's really important. And I and I think we overall in society to bring it back to a more serious place. I think we do have to look at the normalcy with which we accept things and the, the, the deeper subversive nature of it. Because clearly what we've laid out and what we think it's intended to do obviously isn't yielding the results that it's been promoted as. And that comes from a number of issues, but the feminism piece is right at the core of it. But what I'll say in, in final about, um, about the, uh, the, 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 the women's sports piece is, is this, uh, it's a fallacy. It's a fallacy to look at how good a woman can become at something versus all the other people in society. Because we know, statistically speaking, scientifically speaking, uh, I think the stat was if you spend 18 minutes a day for a year doing one particular thing, you will become more you will become better at that thing than 90% of the people in the world. Maybe it's even higher, maybe it's like 95. You spend 18 minutes a day. So if I spend 18 minutes a day writing, okay, it, it's specific type of writing, okay? If I spend 18 minutes a day doing push-ups, if I spend 18 minutes a day uh, kicking a bag, if I spend 18 minutes a day shooting a jump shot, if I spend 18 minutes a day working on my ability to be able to see the field of play, whatever field of play that is. It could be the field of play of soccer, volleyball, basketball. It could be C, uh, CQC, uh, you know, uh, training in, in, in a military or combat context. If I spend 18 minutes a day doing that, I'll be better than 95% of other people in the world. Well, that's because most people are jerk offs and they don't do much of anything. But that is not a testament to the fundamental physiology of women and what their bodies are anatomically built for. That's a testament of a society that's built a narrative, uh, a yeah. sort of societal structure for women, and they filled that role at the niche, right? That and, and I, with all respect to Rose, and I think Rose is great. I've watched her train. She's better than some of the men. I mean, that's going to happen. She's an anomaly, though, uh, from a technical standpoint. Now, could she ever fight? Uh, 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 you know, could she ever fight uh, Henry Cejudo and beat him? impossible and she would tell you that and I can't wait to have Rose on because she'd be one of the first people to quash a lot of this men competing in women's sports nonsense um, and hopefully we'll be able to talk to Greg about that on Friday but I just want to throw that out there before you continue with the bigger issue because these are easy fallacies that people draw upon to justify lunacies oh well this woman's better than 90 percent of men at, at kicking a uh, you know head kicks well yeah you don't have to do much you don't have to yeah. do much in today's society to be better than most either gender at anything because people are just jerk offs. But continue. Let's talk about the deeper issue. I don't mean to divert you, but we're boys, you know. <laughs> no, that's not diversionary. I think that's really, really central to the way that central planning can be done. It, it's so subversive putting women in all these men 
fields of uh, occupation either for, for fun or or for work, taking them out of the home, is um, yeah, there's there's some there's always outlier cases. Uh, meant all the great writers in the history of the world are all male. Then you have Jane Austen, one outlier. Like um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was like a genius, like 155 IQ, um, tremendously subversive force on the history of the Supreme Court. But he was, he was a, a bona fide 155 IQ. He said, nature despises a distinction of kind. Everything's a distinction of degree, meaning he's a nominalist. Well, no, he's ultimately wrong. There are natural kinds. But what what tempted him to say that is there's feels like there's almost always an exception to the rule. Jane Austen, who has amazing, beautiful, anti-feminist, uh, dignified, lovely writings, by the way, Sense and Sensibility is a, a beautiful, beautiful translation into a movie, the 1995 version. Uh, people should all go watch it on, after watching me and Royce talk about the two sexes. Um, Jane Austen's one of, one, you know, she's in the top 20 all-time writers. Now, that, that there are no other women, right? Uh, no other women, because this is a, I mean, Dostoevsky, the great one. Uh, AJ reminded me that he, he talks about something called women's prophets. All the prophets are male. All the writers are male. All of the, uh, the greatest chess players in the history of the world, contrary to what Netflix says, are male. I cover in this book, and there is a sports section in the case for patriarchy, uh, uh, the Williams sisters. Uh, Venus started talking smack, and she's like, I'll bet you, and this is relatively humble. It's still diluted, but it's relatively humble. Around 2000, 2001, Venus said, I'll bet you I could beat about the 200th ranked male tennis player in the world. Did you know that? She said, I I'll bet you I could. ESPN covered the story up as much as they could, but, and barely ever talks about it. She said, you know, I couldn't beat the top 100. I couldn't even beat someone in the top 200, but number 200. So she contacted the guy that was currently number 200. His name was Karsten Brash, a uh, German tennis player. And she said, hey, you're number 200. You're kind of a no one in the male world. I'll bet you I could beat you. And so the day, he didn't warm up. She, was all, she came out there all warmed up. He smoked a cig, drank a beer, then went out there without warming up and beat her, whatever it is, six, six love or whatever the, however the fuck their scoring works, right? And then Serena walks up and, and he, he, with one beer, one cigarette, not warmed up, having just creamed the goat or whatever, or whichever one's the goat, I don't know. Serena's considered the, the goat. Other, Venus was the, you know, she was the precursor before, before Serena. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was Venus and then Serena walks up and he takes her down six, one. And the, the, what I respect about Serena is now she talks about it, and uh, I think she's talking to Oprah, and she said, look, they're not even the same sport. Like, women can do these things. I mean, she's not, she's not a case for patriarchy reader, so she's not going to be all the way based. But she's like, women can do these things, but don't call it the same sport. Like, women's basketball is not basketball. Women's tennis is not tennis. And she said, I've never in my life played tennis six hours a day for most of my life. Never had a ball returned that fast to me. Never had a ball served that fast to me. It is a different sport. And then uh, they tried to, to push her on this a little. Oh, come on, you're, you're greater than some of the men. She's like, no, I don't know. How far down would I have to go? 800th? I probably couldn't be 800th ranked man in the world. They're not the same sport. Now, the tremendous opportunity cost, and same thing for chess, because our brain chemistry is all different. Chess is a male endeavor. Um, there are not there. There's not a woman in the top hundred ranked uh, chess masters of all time. Je so it's just it's across all categories. When women are because of g the original gender dysphoria, Royce, which is first wave feminism, when they're being pushed into when they're being shamed from doing what they're really good at, which is beautifying themes things behind the scenes, private. Remember, women private, male public. When they've been coaxed out of the home place and, and told, don't do the things you like doing and you're good at doing, do all these male things, yeah. then they make a joke out of it. Like, if you say the things I'm saying, you're some sleazebag, red pill, cobra tape kind of guy. And, and then people chuckle. I'm like, no, 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 here's the thing. It's hard to say what I'm saying without sounding like a shitbag, like cobra tape. I'm saying all these things and I'm saying, 
Men and women should both be virgins until they're married. Men should, even though their wife has to submit to them in, in all things, be a king servant. Men and women should not be yelling at each other in the home place. The woman should look up to him like a king. He should talk to her like a queen. But it, it start, you got to put first things first. Yeah. And that can't happen. Like people automatically talk. This is what our CMAS podcast does every day. We're like, no, 70% of the things guys like Andrew Tate are saying are true. But they miss the other 30%. By a, by a wide margin. Real. By by a wide margin, the thirty well, percent that he's wrong let, on let's, is so wrong. Let me let me ask you about the monogamy one because well, I want to get let let's dive into this. To finish what you're saying first, but I want to let's make sure to touch on the monogamy and the Andrew Tate motif when, when we can. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bookmark that for two minutes from now. Yeah. Um, I it's just there's a conversation between first and second wave feminism, which is another another proof that second wave feminism is not the first one that went bad, which all the conservatives say. But it's it's sometime between 1848 and 1970. I think it happened in the early 50s. Between Simone de Beauvoir, who's a French feminist, and Betty Friedan, the American feminist who was associable with second wave feminism. And Simone de Beauvoir, who is the elder, said, look, Betty, you Americans, you're so obsessed with choice, liberty, freedom of the vote, you know, autonomy. We French don't have that similar hangup. For French feminism, it's been very convenient that we don't wait around for all French women to choose to leave the home. And she admitted to Betty Friedan, women will never choose to leave the home. It's their more natural domain. Mm. Women are more naturally private. She's admitting all the things that I'm saying. Mm. We forced them in France with legislation. And Betty Friedan is like, well, I'm not so sure. I, I think American women will choose to leave the home. And Simone de Beauvoir, who's considered the more radical feminist than Betty Friedan, is like, no, they won't. Why would they? Women are built to be at home. Did you know if since 1970, Time, I think it's Time, updates this. Uh, every year, uh, Wolf, Wolf, Wolferson, Stevenson and Wolfer did a study. It's called the the paradox of declining female happiness. Since women were forced by shame in America and by legislation in places like France, out of the home where they want to be, where they're happy and comfortable and healthy, they got forced into the workplace. And now, every year, their happiness relative to men goes down a little bit more from 1970. Look, at, look the paper up. It's called The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. And... For them, it's a paradox. I appreciate the study by Wolfer and Stevenson. For me, I just say the phenomenon. It, a paradox is a phenomenon that doesn't make sense. To me, it makes sense. It's intuitive. So what do women do if they don't play football and boxing? By the way, uh, Crumbling Rome uh, saw women forced into combat sports. It's perverse. Uh, they would fight male midgets to the death. I mean, this is, this is the mark of a crumbling culture. <laughs> Dana White screaming is too... Women who deserve to be protected by men beat the fucking shit out of each other. It, it turns my stomach. It's really bad. I, I want women to be protected. I want them to be away from ogling eyes. We all know men are perverts. The, the HR departments were never required in the workplace before men and women were mixing. The rates of adultery went up. It used to be if you're at work, you're in a, a, a place where you're not tempted to flirt with, with women. Um, so the point is, to put the cap on it, what do women do to occupy themselves? What about, well, I'll just tell you what my wife does when she's at home. Uh, baking, new thing, and this makes her really happy. Baking, sewing. She does watercolor lots, and she paints her beautiful hair. People are amazed with what she does. Stitchery, stitchcraft, really fun. Writing, she wrote a book called Ask Your Husband, which set the Catholic world on fire. Reading, praying, fasting, taking naps by day, raising our kids, by the way, homeschooling, pull your kids out of the, the belly of the beast system, mm. homeschooling, and Amen. she can teach them all the things, she's reading, writing, gardening, crafting, keep a journal for heaven's sakes. If you're one of those kids, last point, if you're one of those kids that on the last day of school isn't enthralled 
then I got nothing to say to you. If you're one of those kids that's like, what am I going to do all summer because you have no fucking life? Then you're going to be one of those kids that's like, well, what's a wife supposed to do at home all day? It's like, I, I got, I don't, you're not going to make it. Like, I was one of those kids that three weeks before the end of summer, I would start getting panic attacks because I'm like, I, I love my summer. I'm busy from wire to wire, running around, scraping my knees, fishing, or mostly just playing basketball, but fishing, uh, going to camp, going to basketball camp, uh, having fun, reading books, watching movies. If you don't know what to do, then I don't have hope for you. You're not going to make it. And this is what Steph says to all the women. She just had a woman's summit called Ask Your Husband. No such thing as halfway cooks on the Mob Deep song. And um, <laughs> the great Stephanie Gordon. <laughs> Stephanie Gordon, she's she's uh, she's a fireball. People all ask her, you have such a big personality. How do you submit to your husband and have a big personality? She's like, because that's what women were created to do. Submit to men, but teach the younger women who, who need a hand. But the point is, don't be one of those losers that's excited for the end of summer because you have no private life. You have no personal hobbies. Get hobbies. There are female hobbies and there are male pastimes. And male pursuing the male pastimes makes them happy. A moral happiness, Aristotle describes as eudaimonia, and women pursuing women pastimes, really based on beautifying the home, whether it's gardening outside or, or decorum inside. It's really fun. I mean, around Christmas time, Thanksgiving, we always get new bakery recipes being tried. I have six daughters, people. So uh, new bakery recipes being tried, new fun, exotic uh, dinners being tried. I kind of miss it in the spring and summer because there's not as much cooking or baking between my wife and the home economy. That's what it is. The home is a beautiful place, and it's, it's, it's only a house, a barren house. When And all the popes in the 20th century talked about this too. It, it is, the, the, the home is the female domain. And a woman in war or parliament is the ruin of society, as Pius X said. In the 20th century, a woman in war or parliament is the ruin of society. She belongs at home and she's happy at home. Her biology proves it. She'll stop having her period if she's trying to do things like a man. She'll be stressed out. Uh, women are the white women are the most unhappy because they're forced into the workplace by either shame in America or law in France. They, they stop having their period if they're, they think they have to act like men. They're screeching at their husbands. 70% of the no-fault divorces are, are initiated by women. We have declining female happiness. 70% and people. Now, for, I, let, let me let me stop you here. This is a perfect place to to, to address the monogamy and Cobra Tate uh, uh, deal. And first, before we go there, I want to I want to say this. Let's start from the place where what what Tim is really trying to speak to is our own <clears throat> Catholic and I would venture to guess broader Christian community, or let's extend even to people who believe in God and traditional gender roles by some cultural spiritual faith practice not trying to cope for any other face out there. I'm just saying that there's an alignment you see in that across many faith practices and cultural historical norms, even in Africa and tribes where they don't even have religion. They have these, these very uh, ancient historical gender role norms. Uh, and even there are many Africans now who aren't either Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or anything. They're just, they're just local tribesmen who laugh and, and scoff at the idea that a man could be a woman with a penis. It's an absolutely ridiculous notion to them because they live in the natural way. Um, Can't even say it without laughing. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 but, but, but what Tim is trying to speak to is not this, this, uh, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, not trying to speak to the blatant hypocrisy and lunacy of the fringe gender movement. We're trying to speak to, or he's trying to speak to, and I often am as well, uh, that that self-indicting inner group of people who propose to believe in these cultural, historical, and, and spiritual faith practices and norms, but have cucked and and allowed and conceded all of the ground for these more extreme movements to slowly encroach their way into your home, and and that's that's I think what is most important because, you know, if there was a genuine opposite, and this is what I say to my Protestant brothers and sisters, and even our Catholic community, if you were really as Catholic and Protestant as you say then we wouldn't have become an anti-God country. And in America, the overwhelming, the overwhelming Christian uh, uh, demographic in America are Protestants. I think it's like 50 to 55% Protestant, and then there's like 20 to 30% Catholics, and then the others are Jehovah Witness and, and uh, you know, some other variations and things like that. Um, 
But okay, Protestants, if you want to say this, <laughs> this is a Protestant nation, then how did we get here? I mean, and, and so maybe you can speak to how the, the, the history of the church uh, started to concede for this gender, the, the, how the church laid a predicate for this gender uh, problem. And, I, and also, just before you go there, I want to say this. Um, the, the fringe will obviously reject this whole thing on face value. They'll say, first of all, there is no legitimacy to biology whatsoever, but there's legitimacy to gain a function research where you take the same fundamental mechanisms of, of biology and all types of other scientific method based, uh, you know, inquiry, uh, to, to make a disease or a virus more contagious or more, you know, fatal, so on and so forth. But there is no biology when it comes to men and women that's out. No biology. So the period was just a social construct. So if women start to lose their period because they've been forced into the workplace or forced to do things that men do, that's just fine. No problem. No problem. It's actually a blessing. It's a reprieve on women that they start to lose their period and the burden of childbearing and, and, and being a mother or, or a traditional woman. So that's from the outset. Um, but I want to ask you, and, and uh, again, I want to ask you about this monogamy piece. Because it dawns on me, and I, and I really genuinely would like your, your insight, because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and Jason and I, and I have talked about this, and um, some of the Hebrew Israelite guests uh, that Jason had on talked about this. Um, what is a modern man to do, given what we can see with our eyes and what we can hear with our ears, around marital status in this country, the, the, the construct of marriage in this country as a, as a tool of the government, many interested parties like the Rockefeller Foundation, many elites, uh, marriage is in many ways very politicized, very propagandized as you're, you're illuminating. Uh, what does a modern man do in this situation at the prospect of being expected to marry before he is fruitful and multiplies in a society where marriage is all but consider is, is all but um a prospect of divorce and and in that and with it, with that question <clears throat> it's very clear to many that there is a depopulation agenda now as soon as you say that you'll split the, the room into two camps the one camp of people who accept the predatory and, and deceptive and wicked nature of elites and people and the other camp of people who say no way possible that's just propaganda and conspiracy theory right but all, all, all roads lead, all, all signals, all flags point to uh, a sort of anti-human uh, depopulation uh, impulse. <clears throat> so my, 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 yeah. my, latest, my latest prospect is like, have kids. And yeah, sure, I, and I'm a Catholic. It, under, under marriage, un, under, the, the, uh, uh, under holy matrimony, absolutely. But where are where in history has the Catholic Church had to? I'll say it to you this way. Let me let me pose it another way. I think some of the cuckery in this has has sort of began with uh, the idea of monogamy as a tautology, um, in in Catholic tradition. Because, and I, I'm just trying to brainstorm here. I know many people will say this is a heresy to begin with, but and okay, I'll take it. I'll accept it. I'm just thinking out loud here. There are many times where many, many faithful, devout Catholics have suspended with certain expectations of behavior in the interest of defending themselves or defending the faith. Are we at a stage now in this country where the prospect of war, asymmetrical, cultural, political war, is such that we need to be thinking about reproducing at a very fundamental Catholic Christian level? Well, I, I, think, I think I get... What you're saying, Royce, and yeah, this is just inquiry. So you know, you're not you're not a heretic unless you you, you say it and you defend it and you defend it in the face of a, a diet or something like that. It's it's an important question, isn't it? We have, aside from illegal immigrants in uh, the American Southwest, we have if, if we didn't have all the illegal Mexican immigrants who are counting uh, well above replacement rate, two point zero, two point one, mm -hmm. we'd be under two. The kids per household, just like dying old as a tree, slow as a tree, Europe. Uh, white people in Western civilization, in particular in Europe, are the worst at this. I mean, like some parts of Europe are close to one per household, which is like the lowest in human history. 
There is a contraceptive agenda put out by the same folks that put out the war on the sexes, put out by the same folks as uh, the beer bug. I don't know if we still need to speak in codes, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, the beer virus, <laughs> Mexican beer virus. Um, yes, and think of how efficient the attack on the family is. By the way, in 1917, when... when uh, to, in front of 75,000 people um, on documented on film. Uh, the Virgin Mary appeared to three seers in Fatima on the 13th of each month from May to October and did in front of 75,000 people a miracle of the sun. Um, she said the final attack of Satan on the world, we're near the end of the world. If, if people don't know that in your audience, now they do. We are, we are near, so, yeah, I don't know whether it's a century or, or 10 years or a year. But we're near the end. And the final attack of Satan on the world would come on the family. And uh, th these errors would spread from Russia, who have been major, major expositors of feminism. And we see this playing out before our very eyes right now, as well as everything else she said at Fatima came true. The end of World War I, the start of World War II. Uh, something fishy happening in the Catholic Church in the 1960s. Uh, Anyway, I won't go all into Fatima, but the point is, she. so yes, the attack on the family means that not only men and women will hate each other and will raise kids in a perverted way, right? Where kids are seeing the gender dysphoria, their mom running the house and hating the dad, the dad truckling to the mother and hating at her and being passive aggressive. 99% of the households have this. Um, that no one's religious anymore, no one's taking scripture seriously anymore. Like I said, the best at avoiding feminists have not been the Catholics. I was being a triumphalist last time I appeared. The best are Calvinism-based Protestants. You asked why have Protestants given into this so much? Because they got away from the hardcore tenets of, the, of scripture. And the, the more Calvinism-based uh, sects of Protestantism, there are so many different sects, uh, ever expanding half life, right? Divisions upon divisions are always the ones that take scripture seriously because it's so clear that w that wives must submit to their husbands in all things. Women are not permitted to speak at church, read at church. Women are never permitted by St. Paul in inerrant scripture to teach men. Um, they're only permitted in Timothy and Titus to teach other women how to love their husbands better. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And that's why Steph wrote this book, Ask Your Husband. People were saying, all right, isn't she a hypocrite? No, this woman, this book is addressed to women. But so so I want to give plaudits to the Calvinism-based Protestants. They're legit on feminism because they don't mess around when it comes to scripture. How about the Muslims? A lot of cat what well, yeah, Muslims too. They they don't they don't mess around. Now that's that's they don't mess around at all. Um, you know, that that goes to the other extreme where you have people like Abigail Favale, Catholic feminist, who, who, who insinuate these horrible things about me. Me and my wife are best friends. We're like this. And you get these Catholic uh, fifth wave feminists that will insinuate something horrible about you. I'm either like Cobra Tate or I'm like a Muslim man just because I'm like, no, 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 no. I mean, we, we have a very harmonious relationship. It's, it's joy and laughter 95% of the time. Not every day, but, you know, I don't know. 44 days out of 45 or something like that. And uh, then when we fight, it's, it, we wrap it up quickly because there's a clear hierarchical rank. Okay, well, I mean, we don't almost, we almost never disagree, my wife and I. But when we do, it's like, okay, well, I heard you out. I respect you. You're the coolest person I know, the smartest woman I know, and I'm going to take it the other way. And she says, okay, I just wanted to let you know. That's how it works when you have rank. What they're proposing is... <laughs> Uh, nuts, but like the way you keep birth rates high, Royce, is by getting rid of the lie that um, the economy, the only economy that matters is the macro economy. Um, you say the real economy that matters is the oikonomia. It means household economy, oikonomia in Greek, like Aristotle talked about. Uh, Women are at home, keeping the home beautiful. It's not cold and, and barren uh, the way, I, I don't even know my friends who have working wives, uh, they get home and the, the home is cold and they argue over who's gonna cook. 
and it's dirty and messy and they argue over who's going to clean and they everyone has to go to bed at like eight to get up because you know you just do chores the whole time you're you're it's gender dysphoric there are no clearly assigned roles that correspond with our psychology as a male or our biology as a female it's nuts um but the the fact of the matter is when the home's a beautiful place you get home there's something on you, you know your wife greets you at the door says hey I, you know how you doing honey and she looks beautiful and yeah a lot of the time she's barefoot and pregnant you're going to keep her barefoot and pregnant in a way where she wants. Wolfer and Stevenson proved this is what, what women want, actually, and they'll tell you the truth. Um, because things are so harmonious. You tend to reproduce a lot. Uh, whereas your, 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 all your sex in the city friends who bought into that uh, Judeo-Buddhist lie they got from programming like Sex in the City, it's supposed to be so sexy. Men and women hate each other. Like, oh, my stupid husband. Watch any commercial, right? The oafish, yet a fat, yet effeminate husband riding around on a, I don't know, a Segway and he falls into the ocean or something. That's an that's a insurance commercial I just saw at the end of the Warriors game last night. Um, it's every commercial. The sexes hate each other. They never have sex with each other. Like literally, if you make husbands and wives on a macroscopic scale hate one another, the men are always talking shit about their tyrant wives to their other men, which is pathetic. How how much more emasculated and cucked could you get? You're afraid of your five foot three wife. Oh my goodness, I can't stand it. When, guy, when guys horrible. start talking like that around me, this is you know I'm the I'm the I'm the number one right now. I'll go out on a limb and say, not to pat myself on the back, I am the number one voice uh, raising the alarm about what I just described as outright cuckery in the society. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not passive. It's not, it's not being a, a you know, I wouldn't even say it's gender dysphoric. It's like, it's like a, a romantic and exotic infatuation with that gender dynamic. Like men actually kind of giggle at it. They kind of like, it's like a kink, you know? Yeah. It's a kink for us yeah. to get together as men in groups of 10 or 20 and say, oh, you know, happy wife, happy life, or we all have to worry about. I see it with Christian, with, with Christians and Catholics all the time. Happy wife, happy life. I'm like, that's the ultimate form of cuckery. I don't even know what you, you. yeah, you know, your wife should be happy, but she shouldn't be happy as the tyrant in the household that's making you lose, you know, taking years off your life. That's utterly insane. But it's, and it's, it's not just between men and women. I don't want to you know, uh, sidetrack you. I want you to continue in your thread, but the the delegitimization or emasculation of men in the home has become the cuckery of the federal government and the expansion of federal government has become synonymous yeah. with the this dysphoric, uh, uh, you know, role of women. And now not only do we cuck to our women, we cuck to the tyranny of the government. It just comes sequentially if you look through history, but go ahead. Uh, okay, so I have four pillars with my channel, okay. right? Because I got I got sick of just doing every show on evil new WEF type stuff Pope Francis is doing. It's too 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 negative. I, I still do a show like that every once in a while, but the four pillars of my show are associable, Royce, with my four books, which are Catholic Republic, The Case for Patriarchy, Rules for Retrogrades, 40, 40 anti Alinsky rules to take society back, basically right wing community organizing. And don't go to college. And I have like Tons. I have a PHL, a master's degree. I have a JD. I went to law school. I have a double undergraduate degree. And I'm like, don't fucking go to college. Dr. Michael Robillard, who wrote the book with me, who you've, you've come on our, our C-Mask show, Christian Masculinism. This guy is an Oxford philosopher, right? He's spent time at places like Notre Dame. He's, he's got two master's degrees. He was an army ranger. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a fighter, amateur pro uh, fighter. Super tough guy, all-American wrestler. He had to spend time at Oxford. He's an Oxford philosopher, and we co-wrote this book, Don't Go to College. Here's how the four pillars go together. It's exactly what you just said. People had enough evidence to make the claim during Beer Bug, and only the brightest ones made it. I was very disappointed. So Catholic Republic, all about subsidiarity. The Catholic teaching about local small government. It is a grave evil, a mortal sin, for a more far away sphere of government, like the federal government, to ever take something a more local government, like county or state, could do. And this includes, it's more, it's wrong for county or even city government to take away the function of the real governor of a household. 
the father when it's in the competence of the more local sphere. Okay, so that's what Catholic Republic, my first book, is all about. Milo published Milo Yiannopoulos published it, and and um, it, it, that book created a big wave. It kind of gave me my my legs uh, on the, the the public circuit. Um, so subsidiarity is what you're talking about. When the the faraway government cucks us, they're taking away the second pillar, the role of the father. The the household governor is the father, and guess what? I am a very small government guy. I'm not an integralist. I'm not a post-liberal. I'm a very small government guy like you. The father has the governing power to decide most things. You don't even need to look to local governing laws, which are, of course, less emasculating than federal governing laws. Think about what was happening under FDR. There's a case called Wickard versus Filburn. I'm also a kind of history of SCOTUS buff. In Wickard v. Filburn in 1927, they were saying that federally— FDR's laws were upholdable under the Constitution that um, a wheat farmer in anywhere in the federal government, Honolulu, 5,000 miles, a world away from D.C., it was constitutional to make a law saying a, a, a wheat farmer couldn't grow and consume his own wheat from 5,000 miles away, different climatic zone. They don't know what's going on here and here. Subsidiarity requires patriarchy, right? They go together like this. And I, I've told a bunch of the right wing big government people like the integralists this during COVID or sorry, during beer bug. Yeah. I don't know if that'll get you in trouble. Yeah. No, say um, COVID. We say COVID all the time on the show. All right. All right. It's fucking COVID. Mm -hmm. But um, OK, so they say, no, my kid's not taking the vax. Good. They shouldn't. You know, my 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 one of my best friends directed died suddenly. He can tell you and substantiate it more than I can specifically. Don't take vaccine people. Well, but my kid, if he wants to go to school, um, he has to take the vaccine. This is like the federal government cucking me. I'm like, exactly. The father should be making all these decisions uh, for his kid, but he has to go to school. This cues up the third pillar. When the federal government is cucking us on local government, the local government should come from the household. That's a mixture of subsidiarity and patriarchy. It tends to be at the behest of things like the kids being out of the household, kind of like the mom mm. being out of the household mm. inappropriately. This is why you homeschool your kids. You homeschool your kids are like, screw it. I, I'm on my own system. I have a true household economy. We almost never need to go out anymore, uh, aside from getting groceries. And we're trying to grow some of our own food as well. But the point is you you literally have these, these three pillars which go together. Homeschool, where you, know, where you have a family economy. Patriarchy, where you are a divine, uh, not a divine, <laughs> they're going to love that one. Uh, you are a, a, uh, a monarch, a benign monarch who love, is not yelling at your wife, not yelling at your kids, but they respect you and you make goodly laws for them. You create a good regime. This means you don't need big government. You know, the, the father is cucked by the federal government. This is a very direct correlation, and it, it's sta staggering to see how many people didn't see this after COVID. But, but I'm telling you, I promise you, my household is not the, not the Crowder household. You know, everyone saw that video and was horrified, and I was, I was horrified that um, I was horrified that Daily Wire was, was engaging in such muckracking. But yeah, the Crowder household looked like an out-of-control battle of the sexes household probably lots of lots of feminism there had stolen in and then you got the uncaring seeming husband i mean this is exactly what feminism produces uh men and women being callous toward each other not wanting to procreate not having enough kids um remember contraception is literally a, a man or a woman putting up a barrier one between the other and saying no i, I don't want your fluids it's very personal and it's very emasculating. There's nothing more emasculating in the form of contraception than <laughs> um, when men actually get get the uh, what they call the snip snip. It's like, look, we need to be virile. We need to have lots of kids. They need to be in the context of, uh, you know, marital household. But um, everyone will get along, and then everyone will be properly socialized if we homeschool because the the little kid, the little boy, little girl have lots of fun little sisters. I, that's what I'm going to do after we finish here. Is go. Homeschool them. I got seven little kids. I wish I had more. Uh, I don't have enough. But the point is, the contraceptive, uh, you know, pro-abort, 
elites around the world do not want us having our own households because our own households are like little polities and they're not invited. Mm. And go, to go back to my, my original question, let, let's, let's, let's uh, dial back to the Andrew Tate motif with the Nama. My, my, my huge criticism of, of Andrew Tate as an oppositional force to the corrupt status quo narrative not to say that he's controlled the opposition because they certainly went out of their way to take him out. And, and I don't think that that was, um, I don't think that that was controlled or planned. I think they went out of their way to take him out in a genuine way. They, they see him as a genuine threat. And it's not even that, you know, don't get me wrong. He's a kickboxing champion and he says some great things, but he's an anomaly kind of in the way that Donald Trump is that he's not this overwhelmingly charismatic, handsome, beautiful, uh, uh, you know, seamlessly articulate figure. You know, he's not a John F. Kennedy. He's not a, you know, he's kind of yeah. like a ragtag from the streets type of type of uh, voice out there. And, you know, even the tone and inflections of his voice are kind of like, there, there's nothing perfect about it. And I think that's what a lot of people really like because uh, yeah. he doesn't have that polished sort of fake feel to him, right? Um, but But at the same time, one of the glaring, one of the glaring gaps in his... And his and his presentation, one, but but his his rhetoric as well, is the validation of materialism as a freeing capacity to tyranny and wickedness. I I do see this as a fatal flaw, and um, I think now you're going to hear his message start to change because he's run into a situation where the height of authority in any fiat currency, social or political organization is the government. And it's not just the government of a certain municipality. Now it's a global government and the Romanian one wants to clip him out. And they're probably clipping him out on orders from some higher authority because Romania is a cuck nation, right? They're not a real, they're not a real polity themselves. They're a WEF, NATO, uh, European aristocratic satellite state, right? Um, so yep. uh, in the Eastern Bloc, which was a remnant of a uh, paperclip and the whole Eastern Bloc uh, fault line Nazi deal. But Anyway, that's another another thing entirely. Um, one would one would ask why Andrew Tate felt so comfortable in Romania in the first place, and that that's kind of his motif, right? And that's this whole passport bros. And I don't want to knock him because I understand uh, the freedom of movement. We expressly support the freedom of movement here, and I support people's right to move about the world as they will. Um, at the same time. Um, this sort of metro, this sort of reverse metropolitanism, right, is mm -hmm. what Andrew Tate is really pushing, right, uh, and it's radical mm -hmm. materialism as well. And then the the anti monogamy is just seen as a byproduct of a lifestyle like that. Like, if I'm traveling around the world and I have a passport and a Lamborghini and I have a pocket full of cash, of course I'm going to have any woman I want. And the two get conflated. Right. The two get radically conflated because, from my vantage point, it's like. Again, I'll say it again, and and I'd like you to weigh in on this more more directly if you can. At times, Catholics, Christians, people who believe in God have suspended with certain expectations of the faith practice, uh, given the prospect of war, right? And that's I'm supposed to honor my my uh, you know, uh, let's say use the Ten Commandments for example: Thou shalt not kill. Well, when we go to war, we have to kill, and we can square that because we we designate and identify war times in a very specific way. This nation's invading our nation, our backs against the wall, despite what God might want me to do, I'm forced to defend myself. And even in sometimes, uh, some cases I'm forced to defend myself in the name of Christ uh, or in the name of God. We, we've done that before as Christians. Are we in a place now where the institution, the very fundamental institution of marriage from a legal standpoint is corrupted so that men should not be looking should not be reliant upon being being married before they have children, and I, I and I say that selfishly because um, I came up as an athlete, right, Tim? So I had a different warning about marriage. I had a different warning about the the dangers of of marriage that were predicated around the corruption of the gender sex war. Right? It's like no women will come after you just because they think you're a meal ticket, marry you and divorce you and take half your money. And we do have a gold digger epidemic in this nation. <laughs> and we have it even in the Christian community in many ways. Many, many 
uh, Christian women do not see marriage as insoluble. Um, so just given the prospect of this whole divorce racket, the anti-family court racket, the ability for a woman to marry you and then divorce you and then have complete dominion over your children under the tip of a spear or the uh, uh, under the, the threat of a bullet, which is the federal government, the grandiosity of it, are men charged, to, and Christian and Catholic men charged, to sort of redefine uh, the most base level? I'm talking how we bring our kids up to think about it. Yeah, ideally you would want to be married, but we're not gonna die. We're not gonna die out in faithlessness as Christians because white liberal women have convinced a bunch of other women that the the corruption of the institution of marriage is valid. Is that a real? Is that a legitimate consideration? Well, we we've dealt with this in about three different sea mask episodes, Royce. Maybe you should you should join us and dialogue it out. Because I mean, like that's I we consider that seventy percent of the wrong stuff Tate says. Um, but there are premises that are part of the 30% of right stuff, he says, which is to say it's a gynocentric lawfare that rules. It, it actually favors women um, at the level of they have their protected scrutiny class in equal protection cases. The, the courts will always give the kids to the moms. The courts will always favor the moms. Uh, it's, it's gynocentric lawfare. So that is not part of the bunk, he says. That's absolutely true. And and you can intone that uh, about 50,000 times more intelligently than he can. So maybe you should join us on a sea mask upcoming. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it, it was good. The one you, you joined us on was one of my favorite episodes, you and AJ. Here's the answer. There was some, some remember, I'm, may, I'm mainly known in the Catholic world, some kind of I forget who it was. Some prissy Catholic woman account was like, the women don't date any men that look at porn. And it's like, okay, you probably don't want to ask this on the first date, but I think it's a fair question on the second or the third day. Do you look at any porn? I said, I retweeted and I said with a comment, I agree. Women should, if they can find out relatively early, not date men who date who look at porn. Catholic men, you should not date any women, for that matter, who plan on having a career, plan on, well, you know, want to be out of the home much and are not prepared to submit to you under the auspices of Ephesians 5, 21 through 24. Okay, cool. We're, we're good, right? I affirmed what that lady said. But men have brothers too, and we are the leaders. We are tasked with being the leaders in society. With that said, when I was stumping this book, it didn't make as much controversy as my wife's book, Ask Your Husband, did. This is Ask Your Husband. People should check this out. And people should check out, I should get you to stream on Getter, uh, Steph's Woman's uh, yeah, we Summit. Yeah, will. It That'd was be great. amazing. Yeah, it, it was amazing. With specific we'll get that regard, done, no doubt. We'll actually make sure we get that done. We'll stream it on my channel. Sweet. Yeah, that'd be great. It was seven women that were like, I love my husband so much. He's so good. Like One of them was a, an influencer on um, TikTok. And she's like, oh, man, I, I just I have to be careful when we go out. I don't say everything I like because my husband, I submit to him in all things. But if I say I like something, he's going to go buy it for me. She's like, I have to be careful. I mean, it's so harmonious. It's like the politeness battle. And that's that's how it is almost every day with me and my wife. And it was um, Jesse Romero's wife, who is in her 60s. And my friend Stephen Rummelsberg, another Catholic influencer who um, his wife is in her 50s and Steph's in her 40s or a couple 30-year-olds, a couple 20-year-olds. And it was just amazing hearing all these lovely women say like, I'm not the boss. I love not being the boss. Yeah. And I love my husband. And that's how I serve Jesus is through serving my husband. That's how I obey Jesus through obeying my husband. Those women are out there. When I, oh, this is what I was saying. This came about six months before my wife's book came out, the female perspective on it. I thought when I went to the center right Catholic universities to, to, to give talks on this book, Royce, I thought that they were further right. I went to Franciscan university, kind of the lead, the biggest, you know, faithful Catholic mm -hmm. university mm -hmm. in America today. All the, all the big well-known ones are gone like Notre Dame. They're all, they're all gone. They're Marxist, but there are a lot. It was a packed house. I was talking and, um, you know, a lot of people that had the book and liked the book cause it is somewhat right of center, but there are a lot of girls sitting like this. You know, at Franciscan, these are the faithful Catholics whose parents raised them 
faithfully enough for them to know, hey, I don't want to send him to Notre Dame or Loyola or Loyola Marymount or, or Villanova. That, that's just Marxist. So in that audience, there were a bunch of women sitting like that. But And it was still, I would say it was about 50-50. Mm. So to speak to your question, is Andrew Tate right that men, and, and this is a big question for my, my good friend, Dr. Michael Robillard, who you've met, the, the, the Army Ranger guy, because he's the only one on the Seamask show, it's four of us every week, who's not married. Um, and so he's, like, like you, he intones sympathy for what Tate's saying. But then he said, he, what he told me when he stayed with me for about a month, to finish writing, don't go to college. We just knocked it all out and wrote every day and had a good time. He was like, look, man, I've the way you properly define feminism, Tim, in the case for patriarchy, I've only met four non-feminist women in my entire life that actually follow the Christian teaching. And all of them were at your household. It was Steph and a couple of Steph's friends and then a couple of your ex, your former students' young wives. Um, so. He's like, so how am I supposed to not think he, – he thinks that, that Cobra Tate's sleaze an internal contradiction. Women should be loyal to men but not men to women. That's like a direct quote. How, well, how does that work? That's not how loyalty works. We should both be loyal and monogamous to each other. He knows that's sleazy because Dr. Robillard's one of the smartest guys yeah. I've ever met. But he's like, what about the lawfare question? Why should we protect the TERFs? Guys like me who are fighters, why you know, was a soldier. Why should I go and protect the TERFs from giant men who are now attacking them after what the TERFs have said about men like us, traditional Catholic men? Why the fuck should I do this? And I'm like, look, man, I get it. You're not wrong to raise the point. But here's the thing. When I go and I speak at Franciscan, it's still like 50-50. That's a pretty big school. I was disappointed that 50% of the women there are basically fifth wave feminists. But 50% at a big school and schools like it, Ave Maria, Christendom College, Benedictine, these are pretty big Catholic schools on the, the Cardinal Newman list of schools. And they're good, faithful Protestant colleges, too, that you could go to where most of the girls or at least half of the girls are still anti-feminist. So you got to do a little extra work as a male. To make sure that you don't get divorced, taken for half of what you're worth, you know, misused, abused in the courts, have your kids taken from you, called a pig. You got to do a little extra work than ever before in human history because feminism, as it came out under second wave feminism, is like the most evil thing that's ever happened. It's the beating heart of leftism. Yeah. Abortion is feminism. Feminism is abortion. Same thing with second wave. Um. Uh, you got to do a little more work, but you could still find great women. But and one question, way women the, the, are— The question I have for you, though, is this, too, is if if you even find a woman that's at a San Friskin, you know, university, what is she doing at university if she doesn't plan to have a career? Why would she even be at university? She's learning how to—I'm sure at San Friskin they're not teaching women the the uh, the very disciplines of, of how to support your husband in, a, uh, in his particular professional— or industry or field of, of competence, right? It is, it's, not a, it's not a university of, of, it's not a supportive role university. They're teaching women how to have careers and, and build resumes and, and be trained in, in some profession. So, I mean, even from the outset, it would seem many of these Catholic and Christian universities are uh, down the wrong path, right? That's true when it comes to things like the nursing school, and like, uh, but but it's not true. This speaks to a whole other topic for a whole other yeah. day. What is the real purpose of human education? And I, I know your 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 BFF AJ is really really strong in yeah. this area. Read the writings of like Stephen Jonathan Rummelsberg, my friend, or Anthony Eslin. The purpose of human education is the speculative sciences, which are uh, logic philosophy, theology, queen of the sciences. These are utterly, as I could tell you, because I have philosophy degrees, these are utterly impracticable in the workplace. And what women, I've moved to a 95% of young men and 100% of young women probably shouldn't go to college. That That's not as hard a stance as I have on this. But the the what I always said as I wrote this book, my second to last, is young women have a unique opportunity to study 
as future homeschoolers to their kids mm. to study things that a lot of young men feel the pressure that they want to study. Everyone should study philosophy and theology, the two highest sciences. It's about how to have eudaimonia, a good life. Yeah. We're studying moral, practical philosophy. And then you go higher from there to studying metaphysics and theology. It's beautiful. The things which inform true liberal education in the best sense. Um, young women don't have the concerns of having to get a job. So what they, what they call that at Franciscan is the MRS degree, the degree to go there and get their missus degree. Uh, you could do like my, my buddy Chris Plants. He met his wife at Franciscan. She was there for a year, took some good courses on theology and philosophy. They met. She dropped out and went back home, and they married shortly thereafter. It's a good – It's ideally, you want to meet in high school. You know, I met my wife when she was 19 – when she was 18. We were friends for a while. We didn't get married right out of high school and we didn't date right away. But that's sort of the solution is when men, if they're like you, hyper talented athletes that are going to go be millionaires or whatever, I, I definitely get not trusting strangers. This is why the system, you know, we have rule swallowing exceptions. The rule should be, on the other hand, try to meet your mate in high school the way it's been done for all of human yeah, history. I would agree. Right. right? You're young and fertile, and you're not a kid when you're 16. The Virgin Mary was the Theotokos, the mother of uh, the Christ, when she was 16, and she's the best woman ever, and she was the best model for motherhood and wifehood ever. And she was, even though she's the queen of the saints, she still said yes all the time to her boss, uh, Saint Joseph, the scourge of demons, most based uh, father ever. So the point is, meet your meet your spouse as young as you can high school is not too young a place this was actually one of the things that got me in the most trouble as a firebrand theology professor when i still taught uh high school in a conservative enclave in california they would get mad at me because i'd say hey get a good boyfriend a girlfriend now vet him a little bit like don't go to college or if you go to college go together and get married a year into college get married young start having babies this was the thing that pissed off even the conservative parents and i'm like anything else is trouble once you hit middle 20s you don't know who you can trust even if you're not a famous rich royce white nba player you don't know who you can trust outside of high school college prolongs the period a little bit where you're still kind of kids and you're still kind of young but you should be – young men out there, you should be seeking to meet a, a, a goodly young woman before everyone's got this high-ass body count, right? Because humans are fallen. They're going to make mistakes. If you're 30, you're not – it's very unlikely you're going to be a virgin, even if you're somewhat virtuous. If you're not even that virtuous but you're 18, a lot of people are still virgins. They meet their, their, their wife or their husband. And it just things go. Nobody's better. getting. They're, I mean, just just practically speaking, nobody is nobody's getting married at eighteen. And and nay, I say that the church, as as a general premise in culture and in practice, is not encouraging people to get married at a younger age. This is my real criticism of Catholic, the Catholic Church, and the Christian community writ large. Is is and and I'll throw this to you as an example of this, and and then we can we can start to wrap up because I know you got to run. He's an important man with many many important tasks, but I want to have you back on again again. I just I love these dialogues we're having. I think we're getting to the root of some some the most important stuff. Um, but let's take this this piece for example. I have kids that were out of wedlock, okay, and what I hear and see in the Christian community is sort of this predicate for an anti-human abortionist contraceptive cultural worldview and it's that your children out of wedlock because they're out of wedlock will be seen as secondary will be seen as what we traditionally would call illegitimate children and this is a dangerous and slippery slope and I think it doesn't properly set the hierarchy or priority of human life in the order of God and and the 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 and the in the order, I mean, the, the, in the, yeah, in the, in the order of God, in, in the, in the natural order, um, because, and we could draw on biblical examples of children that were illegitimate, that were certainly favored, but um, the entire Christian motif, at least culturally in modern days around illegitimate children, and these are your 501c3 Christians, right? Many of them Protestant first, 
but but also pedophiliac and homo homo homosexual uh Catholics that were let into the clergy and things like that is it's it's rampant throughout the Christian America, right? Uh and worldwide. When you say that a child does not bear the fingerprint of God and that they weren't known before they were born because of the circumstance with which their parents conceived them. In my view, you lay a, a, a you lay out a fundamental spiritual and Christian predicate to justify abortion. Okay. And, and so, you know, and I, maybe this is something you and AJ and I need to get together and kind of hash out and get down to the fundamentals of how that mechanism is working. But I really see it as though the Christian church's failure the, the and Catholic Church's failure to properly uh, truncate the premium on life and the the divinity of life at its most infant stages at conception, regardless of the circumstance, lent a huge hand to this neoliberal auspices of abortion, right? And and there were many many in the early days there were many many Christian abortion there were many Christian women who I can't have a child out of wedlock. The circumstance isn't right. The, 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 you know, and, and that was a precursor. And then it became, oh, well, I have a career and it's too early and I'm too young and I'm, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's not like, well, I'm not in love with the guy or whatever the case may be. It's like there are all these societal expectations on me around a, a material acquisition. And you see that play out now in the family court. I mean, I hear it. It's like, if you can't provide your child a material, a material uh, affluent lifestyle that's on par with what we as the federal government deem reasonable and adequate for the child, then you should have just fucking killed your child. Really, that's what you should have done. And that's what the family court is really, that's what they're really pushing. They're saying, if you don't meet all those circumstances, some of which could have been your family's expectation to get married, get married first, if you don't meet those, you probably should have just killed your child. Your thoughts? Well, the, I, first off, that's the perfectionist fallacy, and it's it's pushed hard by the now we know Satanist uh, cardinal Bernadine, who, according to Malachi Martin, in the uh, '70s and '80s, actually had an enthronement to Satan, according to Windswept House. Uh, here in the American Midwest and at the same time a Vatican, Cardinal uh, Joseph Bernadin in Chicago. He um, Look him up. Very, very, very interesting satanic cardinal. Um, he came up with this idea called the seamless garment, which said that the, that the two life issues that the church supports, end of life and beginning of life, euthanasia and abortion, where we categorically reject uh, the evils of these. Well, these should be taken as a, a garment where oh, the whole life is considered. And it's basically a, a way to back end softer stances on abortion because of the kind of perfectionist fallacy you're talking about. Well, will the Catholic Church, like leftists say, if the Catholic Church doesn't actually care about the quality of life of the kid, then um, then they're being hypocritical. Right. And you know we ought to consider the whole life, which is what you hear the left say. This is Cardinal Joseph Bernadine. Absolutely, the church has always affirmed 100% of the time, since the DDK of the apostles, the teaching document of the apostles, um, abortion is like the fourth thing mentioned as an evil, that a human's dignity, because he's made in the image and likeness of God, that means his will and his intellect, image and likeness, are shaped after God's, are fully intact, uh, even even born outside of wedlock. And the reason this is a personal issue for me, not I wasn't born out of wedlock. I didn't have brothers born out of wedlock, but my favorite person in the world, and I, I think just the best person I've ever known, uh, my, is my wife, Steph. You should, t dude, you should talk to Steph. Steph is the child of a 16 year old mother who, who had a, she, her mother had a wild childhood. I'm not going to say here how wild, but, uh, it is a grace of God that I have Steph. And you know, Steph's, Steph's pretty, pretty well known. She insinuates some of these things, but talks about them a little more directly in her book, Ask Your Husband. But she's like, when I met her when she was 18, this beautiful girl who's just like the opposite 
her mom, like had a bedtime for herself. She knew how wild it was to have, uh, to have come up as a, she always makes the joke. Hey, I'm a bastard. You're talking to a bastard. Um, and it, it, she's just the best person I've ever known. Yeah. Everyone who knows my channel knows Steph or she's helped thousands of women with this book. Just love your husbands, uh, do what your husbands say. Uh, it is the most beautiful lifestyle. And when you're raised by an atheist feminist who goes from man to man to man, uh, Steph was dragged suddenly, I'll say at one point in her life when she was, I think, uh, nine, to Germany, uh, like overnight. Uh, it, you know, she was there for two years. Wow. I, I mean, she has a wild childhood. Wow. No one has a, a crazier childhood than my wife, Steph. And, um, no one is more politically conservative or more fire. You think I'm fire breathing anti feminist? You should get Steph on. She's like, the way is for women to get married and to just love their husbands, do everything to be the helpmeet or the handmaiden to their husband and, and get a good husband. It's your choice. Christianity was the first worldview in the history of the world that gave women the choice. Their father. Sacramentally, it's an invalid marriage if your father marries you off, right. a young woman, to some guy that you didn't want to marry. That's Christianity. Make a good choice is the most important choice you'll ever make. Marry a good man. He'll treat you great. You treat him great every day. And same thing with men. This is what Steph and I are all about. If you pick wisely, and you should be picking young, you, you grow together. Your psychology's intertwined. You grow into one flesh. This is the teaching. If you make a mistake, because, hey, young men, women are pretty. You have less impulse control when you're 18 than when you're 28 than when you're 38. And then you make a, a, a mistake. The church has never taught the child is a mistake, right? Then, you know, you, you, you work, you, you, you back end it from there. Uh, you know, I have lots of really solid Catholic friends that are in this situation uh, in addition to you, Royce, like my friend, the actor. Matt Marsden, you know, in the Transformer movies, uh, studly, studly British dude. Um, yeah, he is. He is like seven or eight kids. His first ones from when he was a young, indiscreet man. It's not it's what we call natural vice in, in the church. Right. It's a natural vice. It's not like unnatural vice. You know, the Skittle stuff is an all too easy pitfall. It doesn't mean the kid has any less dignity. That kid is a child of God. That kid deserves to be loved as much as the other kids. You know, Steph, who's both of whose parents have are married again on her mom's side multiple times. It, it, I understand their logistical problems with, you know, getting to spend more time with this one yeah, than that one. But the point is the church has always taught there's tons of dignity. The solution is to just hope and pray and to develop the virtue in young men that that most of them you know, we'll get married young so they don't fall into this trap. And if they do, it's not the end of the life. Don't don't have an abortion. Raise that baby and love it. And then you're just going to have to get married to either that person or someone else who who's very understanding. And um, you can all still have a good life. You can still have a good life. Well, no doubt. And, you know, I thank you again, Tim, for your time today. We we got to keep going because I know there's much that we can still uh, uh, untangle here in this in this line of country. Um, I want to get Steph on as soon as possible as well. So we'll schedule that when we get off. Send me a copy of your your four your your books if you can. I want to have some here on the desk desk to reference. Um, we'll also stream Steph's Women's Summit on on my Getter page. That would be awesome. I haven't even used my stream feature on my Getter page, but I'm amassing a pretty big audience there. Many of which will see this episode tonight, uh, and and they really enjoyed the last one. Um, and, and, and I'll leave with this. I think, to your point, I think a, a, great, a great disservice has been done to our many Christians and Catholics out there around the prospect and divinity of human life at, at the basis um, and the, the, to the totality of circumstance can't being the sort of predicate for abortion. And, and again, I'll just leave you all with this. Um, there is no level of material or affluent expectation from the federal government that should justify your either aborting your child or um, uh, accepting government tyranny if, uh, in, a, in a sort of a uh, gyno war lawfare uh, on, on behalf of your child. I hear it all the time. People go, 
uh, yeah, well, and the left usually is the one that uses it against me. Like when I ran for office here, ran for Congress here, they're, oh, well, you have, uh, you know, two kids out of wedlock. So how can you talk about uh, abortion or how can you talk about family or any of that? And then, and then same with you, I could hear them saying, well, you're telling people not to go to college, but you have degrees. Understand it's actually people who have had that experience who were probably meant to go through that experience, right? Yeah. So they can, so they yeah. can actually pay it forward and, and warn others about the, the, the predation and the pitfalls of it uh, that God maybe has in his plans as well. And we see that historically through scripture and we certainly see a need for that now. We need the people who have actually seen the darkest and, and deepest of lies and deception to come forward and warn us. And, and we appreciate all those that do. Um, thank you again, Tim Gordon. I really appreciate your time, brother. The fight continues. Thank you so much. It's, it's always great being with you. Are, yeah, who's going to be the better warner against poison? Oh, I started drinking the cup. I tasted poison. Don't do it. It would be retorted to say, don't listen to this guy. You know, that's that's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. And, you know, God bless your your work, Royce. And don't don't ever let him tell you that, man. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Let's talk soon. And, uh, you know, let's uh, let's keep it rolling, man. I really appreciate these last two conversations. No doubt. Me too. Des Bolt.